Hello, my name's Sarah and I'm part of the team here at Imagineer. This video is all about the pioneers of person-centred planning. If you've ever um, experienced or come across um, any aspect of person-centred planning before, particularly if you work in the UK in the field of health and social care, you might have mixed ideas about what it is and where it comes from. Some people who are newer to health and social care or who haven't been um, in the sector for maybe longer than five or 10 years, would assume that person-centred planning is a new thing, that it originated in the UK. So this video really is just to give you a little bit of context on the history of it and where the people that it started with, um, really to honour the people who developed these approaches in the first place. Over the years, person-centred planning came across the UK and in 2001, it was mentioned for the first time within government policy. So the Valuing People white paper, which was all about um, care and support of people with learning disabilities, mentioned person-centred planning for the first time in a, a UK government policy document. And then it really started to become embedded as an approach uh, in social care and in health in the UK from then onwards. Now, um, at the time of recording, we are working under the legislation or the legal framework of the CARE Act, which started in 2014 and became embedded in practice from 2015 onwards. And person-centred planning forms a really core part of the principles of the CARE Act um, framework. But it's really important for us to take a look back to where it started and to understand the roots of it and the philosophy so that we don't... Um, treat it as a, a tick box approach or something that just has to be done because it's in the regulations. So let's take a little look. There are several key person-centred planning approaches um, that are embedded within what we now know in the UK. Um, so this is the first one we're going to look at. This is called circles of support. Um, now, the little image that you see on the right is our own Imagineer version of this tool, but um, it originated with these three people on the slide. So you can see from left to right, Jack Pierpoint, Marsha Forrest and Judith Stowe. Now, Judith was a lady um, with uh, living with disabilities and she was in um, an institutional residential care facility. Um, she was an incredibly uh, wise, educated, talented, capable lady, but she required a significant level of um, care and support to enable her to live her day to day life. And because she was in this institutional facility, she was very much uh, restricted by the, um, the routines and the timings and the schedules of the care facility. And she was befriended by these two people, Jack Pierpoint and Marsha Forrest, um, and they started doing some work with Judith to um, to enable her to actually um, realise the life that she was capable of and that she dreamed of having. Um, now, this tool particularly is is um, developed as a way of looking at somebody's relationship connections to understand um, where their current relationships and connections exist and where perhaps opportunities to develop further connections could reside. So if you're interested in finding out more about this tool, um, it's called Circles of Support. It's sometimes called a relationship circle or a relationship map as well. Um, we do have a um, copy of this on the Imagineer website. So you can have a look there under our templates section if you're interested in looking in more detail about the, how the tool itself works. Moving on, we have an approach that's called essential lifestyle planning. And this was developed by a gentleman called Michael Small, um, who you can see here pictured on the slide. And essential lifestyle planning was developed particularly as an approach for people who um, lacked mental capacity and weren't able to verbally communicate their wishes, their preferences and their needs. 
Um, it was developed as a style of planning which really enabled the advocates of the people at the centre of the planning process. So that could be family members or, or maybe even people in paid support roles who'd known these people for a very long time and knew the detail, understood the detail of their needs to actually be able to share the detail of what makes sense for the person being supported, what, what a good life looks like for them. And that included exploring detail around people's likes and dislikes, the important parts of their routines and their day, which really made a positive difference, and maybe some information about the things to avoid um, to enable the person not to have a bad day. Um, it included the about me, um, information which is often gathered as a really positive way of, of viewing the person's strengths and ca capacities and their connections and their characteristics and their qualities um, and it's an approach that can be built into individual service design for people who are receiving a bespoke support budget or a bespoke support service that's really being built around them as an individual Personal futures planning um, takes some elements of some, some of the other processes we've been looking at and are going to continue looking at to really capture a sense of the person's story um, and their history um, as part of um, getting everybody on board with understanding the person's journey. So where a person has many professionals involved in their life and um, many different settings. So it could be education professionals, it could be health professionals, it could be social care, it could be therapists. Um, but really getting everyone in the same space of understanding the person's journey, their experience through life and what some of the significant points in their history have been. But, but crucially, it's capturing that person's story from their own perspective. So it's placing a highlight and an emphasis on the areas of the person's story that they feel is significant and want people to understand. And then alongside that, it's really getting to understand what the person's dreams and hopes and aspirations are for their future. Really, really being able to capture and articulate that and using that as a springboard for thinking about future planning around the person. Alongside that, there's the community map, which is used for capturing um, what's around the person in their local area, who they're connected to, where, where are the places that they like to visit and what, what opportunities there might be in that local area. And finally, the relationship map, which helps us to capture who is in the person's life and how they are involved and how they are important. Bringing all that information together um, to help us think about what a plan for the person's future could look like. So John O'Brien and Beth Mount were the pioneers of this planning style. Then we move on to maps. Um, maps really started off um, it, particularly in education settings. MAP is an acronym for making action plans but also over time that's just evolved to actually mean it's a map of the person's life um, so it's really about pinning down all of that really detailed information that helps us to gain an understanding of the person in the center of the planning process so again we use a, a story capture about the person's journey um, and we think about what the person's dreams are but alongside that we balance balance that with information about what would be a complete nightmare scenario for the person so really thinking carefully about what to avoid in planning for the person's future we think about um, who we would enroll in this process so a map process is very collaborative and it's about bringing along all of the people who are in the person's life so that everybody's working towards the same aims and goals and actions so we make a list of who all those people might be. And we really ask those people ideally to be present during the planning process, but also to sign up to what's being discussed and agreed in terms of carrying the plan forward. The person has an opportunity to express what their needs are, and that might also include um, the insights of other people who know them well too. So that could include relatives, advocates, et cetera. Um, we, we include the about me section again as a way of showing real appreciation of who the person is and what contribution they bring to the space that they're in. And then finally, we pull all of that uh, insight into an action plan, which enables us to know how to move forward with that plan. 
over time, Matt um, approach um, evolved and became a little bit more distinct, um, particularly starting with that focus on the future, the focus on the dream. Um, and this is a tool that's called PATH. So uh, PATH is another acronym standing for Planning Alternative Tomorrows with Hope. And the North Star is the starting point of this tool. Um, it's quite um, a visually recognisable shaped planning tool. So if you ever see this arrow with the circle on the end, most people who have anything to do with health and social care would recognise this as the PATH plan tool. Um, but it, it, it's a process that follows a specific order. It's a facilitated process, um, the same as, as the other processes we've been looking at. So you'd have somebody graphicking and capturing the conversation and somebody else as the facilitator leading the group through the conversation and the gathering of the information. So the approach starts with the North Star, um, thinking about the person's dreams, what they want to aim for in the future, what would they do if nothing was holding them back, if money wasn't an issue, um, if nobody was telling them, no, you can't do that. Um, so really capturing those really strong aspirations and hopes and then working backwards from that point of the North Star um, to think about how we make this happen or how we can take steps towards this. So you've got all of the process of, you know, what's happening right now? What's the picture right now? Again, we think about who we would enroll. So who are the people that can feed into this process and support it? How do we get stronger? So what are some of the things we have in place that allow us to be strong and stay strong as we're aiming towards that North Star? And what are some of the things we can put in place to help things stay strong? And that might be, you know, simple things like checking in regularly or having review meetings every so often but there'll be lots of other things as well that go into that section um there's a first step section so what's the first thing we're going to do towards this north star um and then what can we do realistically within the next few months so some of the next steps and finally one year on what would we expect to be seeing in place if we're working towards that north star um dream scenario and managing to stay strong and work towards the steps in the action plan. So this was an approach that evolved out of the MAPS process, but um, with the strong emphasis on starting with the, with the future, with the dream. Um, John O'Brien, Jack Pierpoint and Linda Kahn were involved in um, developing this one. And it's still used very, very commonly in person-centred planning uh, over here in the UK, particularly um, in all sorts of different settings in schools, in colleges, in care settings and in the community as well. It's a great tool that you can use for uh, organisational planning or team planning or vision setting, as well as person-centred planning around an individual. So it's a really versatile tool. What you'll find that a lot of these processes have in common is this set of five accomplishments, which were developed by John and Connie O'Brien. So there are these five things on the slide. People can share ordinary places. That's about everyone having access to common spaces, community. Um, what's in my neighborhood? Can I access it? Um, everyone should be able to make choices uh, about their own lives. Um, that's a fairly obvious one, isn't it? People should have the opportunity to develop abilities um, and build on their strengths and their interests and their passions um, and pursue things that make sense to them. Um, so a really strong emphasis on, on the development of abilities as well. Everyone should be treated with respect and have a valued social role. So that's about recognising everyone has an equal contribution to make in society. And then finally, everyone should be able to grow in their relationships. And these five accomplishments have been the founding principles for a lot of the, the policy and legislation over here in the UK, um, as well as um, kind of the underpinning foundations for all styles of person-centred planning. So they all have these kind of five principles underpinning. And then similarly, further to that, Beth Mount also developed this set of principles, which she calls family resemblances. And these family resemblances should all be um, recognizable within a truly uh, authentic person-centered planning approach so 
regardless of which style you use, which planning process, or whether you just select templates from within those processes and use them as standalone templates for gathering information about the person and helping to write somebody's support plan. You should always see these principles um, and they should always be recognisable within the way that you're doing that approach alongside the person. So seeing people first rather than labels, starting with the person and and really good way to do that is starting with an appreciation of who the person is um, what are the, what is the good stuff about them? What what's their contribution? Uh, what do people like and admire about them? Uh, as a starting point, so we're really getting a sense of the essence of the person and not just um, their needs or their diagnosis. Use ordinary language and in images. This is a really simple principle, but if we apply it to all of our work, it means that nobody is left out everybody is included. So it's a real um, foundational principle of inclusion and equality. Use simple language and use images to support what you're doing. Um, that's a principle that we use here at Imagineer, but also it's just a good founding principle for day-to-day -day life, isn't it? Um, if, we, if we were to do that all the time, nobody would be excluded or struggle to access what we're doing or what we're talking about. Search for people's gifts and capacities in the context of community life. So this is, again, a really strengths focused principle, but really what it means if we drill it down is that when we're thinking about planning around a person, we're thinking around what good support looks like for them and what a good life experience looks like for them. If we search for gifts and capacities that are in the context of community life, it means the person's not going to be restricted to a service based experience. They're not going to only attend a day centre. They're not going to only live in a residential care facility, but actually they're going to have a life that's rooted in community. Um, it's rooted in relationships and connections. It's, it's rooted in places that other people visit um, where we we spend time together and we uh, share the same space. Um, and that's really what is at the center of, of having a, a good life, a community-based life. And the fourth principle is about strengthening the voice of the person. So everything we do in person-centered planning is about thinking about the person being in the center. They're in the driving seat, their voice and their preferences are what drive the whole process. So we're not taking over and saying what we think is best for them. We're not making suggestions and coming up with solutions without involving the voice of the person. Um, sometimes involving the voice of the person means including advocates as well, but it's making sure those advocates provide a really independent voice they amplify the voice of the individual so it's just being very careful about who those advocates are in that planning process to make sure that what's being shared is really authentic and is really focused on the best interests of the person so um we've been through some of the big planning processes and we've thought about some of the tools that are involved in those processes and you might well have come across some of these specific tools listed on the slide here um, tools such as the one page profile that we use as a, a quick way of introducing a person maybe to a new professional that's working alongside them or um, if a new organization is coming in to support the person um, it might be used in a review meeting or a planning meeting um, and they're, they're really a quick at a glance way of learning about the person. And, and again, they're a strengths based tool. So um, really focusing on the good stuff and the positive stuff about the person as a as a first introduction. Um, within that, we might have things like the like and admire tool, um, important to and important for good day and bad day, or the circles of support and relationship map tools that we've discussed earlier on. And these are all examples of person-centered planning tools that come from some of those different processes that we looked at. So the essential lifestyle planning, the personal futures planning, and the path and the maps processes. But it's important to recognize where those tools started, where they came from. They came from real people, came from people um, trying to work out better ways of planning and being supported so they could live good lives as part of their communities. 
And a lot of these approaches have come across to the UK. Um, they've been adopted by organisations and agencies. Um, lots of organisations, including Imagineer, have developed their own versions of these tools. Um, some organisations provide training on it um, or templates that you can access or perhaps purchase or, or download. Um, but it's really important that we recognise where all of these processes started. So we just wanted to take the opportunity at, at Imagineer to honour the pioneers of person-centred planning, to thank them for their work, thank them for their heart, um, and to recognise that all of this stuff um, is embedded in our work as a result of, of the many years of work that they put in decades and decades ago. Um, and we hope that we will continue that good work and be able to build on it. Um, so hope you found that interesting and useful. Please share it in your networks and in your organisations. Um, and if you've got any questions or comments, please do contact us here at Imagineer. Thanks very much. <laughs>